Uh, but now we're going to move on to our next panel. And this panel is sponsored by the Ontario Athletic Therapist Association. And it's going to focus on the topics of recognition, diagnosis, and active recovery. So we're going to be looking about the decision-making processes that we take during the moment a concussion has occurred or when we've recognized it. And I'm really excited to bring about these panelists. Um, they come from a diverse range of athletic care providing, but also we have a panelist who will provide the athlete perspective as well. I'm going to welcome them all to the stage here. We've got Katie Mitchell. Please feel free to come on in. Um, she owns her own clinic, Thrive Neurosport. Bella Page, the founder of Post Concussion Inc., Kim Browses also owns her own clinic and is the membership director of the Ontario Athletic Therapist Association. And Dr. Michael Hutchinson, who is the director for the Center of Sport Related Concussion and Innovation. Sorry, I'll give. He doesn't have a mic. You'll share. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, to start, I think it'd be a really cool way to paint the picture of the importance of recognition, uh, diagnosis, and recovery by getting that athlete perspective. Uh, so I want to direct this first question to you, Bella, because I know you're an aspiring Olympian hopeful, and I want to know what um, or how concussion impacted your career, and what were some of the challenges you faced throughout these uh, concussion experiences? Yeah, for sure. So... As you said, I was an Olympian hopeful. I used to be a competitive athlete for show jumping horses. I was traveling the world at a very young age, starting at 14, uh, without my parents or anybody. And what happened was essentially concussions derailed my life. Uh, I went from supposed to be going to the Olympics. The next 10 years of my life were planned out, but that's not exactly how it worked out as I am sitting here instead of competing. So what of some of the challenges were were an endless list. I could probably talk for a few days about this, but one of the biggest things for me was identity loss. So you don't really know who you are without your sport, especially if you do a sport at a high level. It's all I breathed. It's all I thought about. It's all my family talked about. So getting rid of that was something I had a really hard time with from mental health challenges, anger to the point where when I was taking breaks from competing, I would delete all my social media because that's all it was filled with. And watching friends compete, keep going was really tough. I honestly had a really hard time watching people keep going and I didn't know who I was. I honestly didn't believe I could be anybody else to the point where I kept trying. Uh, I kept competing, I kept going, I'd take breaks, uh, I'd get really different recommendations from doctors. So this was 10, 11 years ago and it's changed a lot. Uh, in the last few years, as many of you may know, but it was always, oh, what if, like if you get hurt again, or, you know, you could do it, you cannot. My parents didn't know what to do. I was very depressed. So I think that's why they let me keep going because it was something that I loved. So it gets really challenging with what athletes can also hide. I was very good at hiding pretty much all of my symptoms if I could do it right. Uh, I had headaches every day, but the longer I had the headaches, the better I got at hiding the headaches and things like that. So it was really challenging that way. And going back and just keep it trying and trying again and again definitely was something that took a toll on me uh, mentally as well as physically. Because as an athlete, a lot of time, like on the field, you don't notice your symptoms. You can ignore them, you can push through. You might be able to notice from an outside perspective, but you can keep going. It's when you stop. So when I'd stop, everything would hit me really hard. So eventually I made the decision to retire and retiring took me seven years, which might seem like a really shocking amount of time, but it took me seven years to accept that I needed to find other things in my life. And if you had told me that I was gonna retire the years before that, I would have told you no, uh, it wouldn't have happened. But eventually I learned that there was a lot more to my life other than sport. And it's not that sport isn't important, but eventually I had to learn that there was other things for me in life other than just competing, just being an athlete. But that took me a really long time. And I like to use the word retire because quitting kind of like feels like you just kind of gave up. But my health decided that for me. Like I said, concussions kind of derailed my life. But, you know, doesn't mean it's a bad life. It's just a very different life from what I planned. Thank you. 
Ella, I really appreciate you sharing that perspective and telling us your story. And to an extent, I can relate more to the mindset. I was never an Olympian hopeful uh, or aspired to be. Um, so I can't really understand that part. But, you know, just the fact that something that you work so hard for your entire life for to get derailed for something that was hard to understand yourself and for the people around you to understand is such a challenging thing. And it's a lot of why we're having these conversations and very much appreciate you sharing that with us. And on this note, I want to kind of push it forward and ask you, Kim, because when we recognize this injury and we even heard it from Bella and even in the first panel, it's a lot of athletes that, you know, try and hide it. And it's very hard to maybe spot it and recognize it. So how can we ensure that these athletes get removed from play and what sort of communication strategies can we create so that everyone involved, including the parents and the coaches, understands how significant this is? Absolutely. And that's a really good question. And it's something um, that's a benefit uh, as an athletic therapist, because as an AT, we have access to a team and those athletes 12 months of the year. And at the end of this of the season, essentially, what you'll see an to do is we'll do a debrief. So we look at the season, we look at the protocols and the procedures and the strategies that worked, but then we also analyze the ones that didn't. We also take in any new evidence, evidence-based evidence protocols that came in. This year, we have a ton of them, um, and we start to implement them. And what we do with that information is that the preseason time, um, and Stephanie said this a few times in the first panel where education is one of our biggest assets as clinicians. And so as an AT with a team, what we get to do is we get to bring the athletes, their parents, sometimes it's a billet family, the agents, the coaches, even the network that might be within your community, we bring them all in. And what we do is we do a preseason education presentation. And in that are non-negotiables. So I go up and I talk to my team and I explain basically what the pathway to care is going to look like, um, what the emergency action plan is going to look like. We're going to identify the person that's going to make those choices, which on my teams is me. And basically we're looking at uh, doing like, for example, families, my family does it. My daughter's here and she can attest to that. We'll do a fire prevention thing with our family and we'll tell our kids how to get out of the house if the fire happens to be in certain parts of the house. So essentially that's what I'm doing with my team. And if an athlete was to take a hit in center ice, um, I go out, I'm taking the uh, athlete off, I'm going to tap my head and I'm going to teach my coaching staff what that means. So when I'm tapping my head and I'm removing this athlete, my coaches know, okay, Kim has suspecting a concussion. That means my doctor is coming down from the stands and that coach now has the opportunity to make the changes he needs to on the bench. He knows that I am immediately taking this athlete off and they are not returning to the field of play. Those things are critical to teach in the preseason. So it, it basically mitigates any misunderstandings. It mitigates any confusion in what the process is and what the protocols are going to be. Um, and from an athlete perspective, it drastically reduces anxiety and fear. They don't have to say, oh boy, I'm going to have to decide whether I go back or not. It's going to be like, no, Kim, this is one of Kim's non-negotiables. I'm off. The coaching staff, the medical staff, and everybody uh, that's considered a stakeholder at the time also knows that I'm going to do an assessment in 24 hours whether the doctor and I can make that diagnosis or not, they know that we're going to do check them again in 48 hours. So those non-negotiables are taught in the preseason. And, and that's, again, one of our most valuable assets as a clinician. The other thing I do with my teams is something that's considered consistent communication. So we do a big piece at the beginning, but then it's really, really important that every Sunday I send emails out to everybody and they're very different emails. So what I send to my coach might be, okay, uh, athlete A is heading into step two and this is what the week is going to look like. But to the athlete, I'm going to say Monday at 8 a.m., you're going to do the Buffalo concussion treadmill test. And then depending on what zone you're able to, to work out in, this is what your week's going to look like. But then the information that I'm sending to maybe the parents or the billet parents, again, is completely different information. It may be, here's a list of pro-inflammatory foods that I'd rather your, you know, your athlete not eat for this week. Um, this is the type of supplement we would like to see them take, whether it's magnesium, omegas. And, and basically, everybody is consistently taught and communicated with every Sunday of every week. And again, back to the beginning, it, it basically reduces anxiety, fear. It's not trying to figure out who's responsible for what stage, because Kim is, because that's a non-negotiable. And it also basically reduces any, any mistakes and anything that could happen. Um, so the most important takeaway from this question for me and for me to share with you guys is early education on the process and the protocol is mandatory. 
um, and not faulting from that and not making changes for different people and having everybody in that shareholder world understanding that. And then the consistent communication shows trends and patterns. We're all about trends and patterns. So when we recognize it, we know what the next stages are going to be. And again, we're mitigating the anxiety and obviously uh, supporting better outcomes. That's great. I love the non-negotiables concept. I think that's such an important thing. And, you know, I think as when I was an athlete, knowing that, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, the importance of having like a community of support, if they all understand those non-negotiables, I think it can really help create a more um, holistic and proactive approach. Um, so I really appreciate you sharing that perspective. But that's obviously focusing on the recognizing very early, early aspects of the stages. And I want to focus this next question to you, Dr. Hutchison, because I'd love for you to paint an outline on what the different recovery stages look like, starting with diagnosis, and how that might differ for someone who's had multiple concussions like Bella. Uh, fair enough. Um, I think we just started to hear some language about stages, which is interesting. So concussion recovery is known to accrue over a sequential number of stages. Typically, there's six of them. It's a progressive, progressive nature of, of activity or stress, as I, as I like to kind of more say it in a more global term. Uh, the one thing that I would say around that is, is sometimes we've made a lot of progressions with stages. Uh, sometimes there's a little bit of uh, difficulty in, in practice when people get caught up in stages. So I'll, I'll at least outline the stages, and I want to kind of maybe reframe how we think about concussion recovery. So the stages would be from the point of the non-negotiable rest, you want to take 24, 48 hours, you're not doing anything. You're trying to get the injury to settle in, understand what the main symptom complaints are, not putting yourself at future risk. Then after that time, stage two would be a reintroduction of physical activity, and that's a low-level aerobic level. If that goes well, as long as there's not too much symptom exacerbation, you move on to sports-specific movements, you increase risk with more team activity, you have a full practice of risk, and then that would be the sequence of stages. You need 24 hours before you progress to each stage. And so as I kind of talk about this, you can see there's a lot of stages, nomenclature, 24 hours. And in practice, that sometimes is very difficult for coaches, practitioners, more often the patients. And so the way I kind of look at it in a more global term is just think of your recovery as elements of stress. And there's really three main components. There's physical stress, cognitive stress, and sensory stress. And so concussion recovery really is the first stage in the first movement is you want to only do one at a time and you want to introduce physical activity. So you're seeing is that cardiovascular system going to exacerbate issues. And if that seems to not be, if that seems fine, then you can move to a second stage where you do more physical activity. So you increase ramp up kind of more stressful, high intensity exercise. Again, trying to see if you're going to elicit symptoms. Again, still maintaining in that physical domain. If that seems to go well, then we layer on cognitive components. That means skills around physical activity, their respective sport, individual skills. And then we layer even more on cognitive elements, team activities, strategies. What's your plays? What are other players going to do? So you're increasing that risk. And the last kind of component is sensory. So on a football practice, bright lights, lots going on, lots of noises. And you're kind of layering the cake of those different elements. So that's generally how I kind of see concussion recovery stages, elements of physical activity, cognitive and sensory. Uh, your second question was about, and actually what I will add to this, that's irrespective of sport as well. Those, those principles apply to work and those, those apply to school. And so again, it's helpful to think if you change the context, you can maintain the same principles with just going to class, don't take notes, right? Adding, adding some elements of note taking, then having obviously screens and stuff like that involved. So you can do that for both school and work as well. There, your second question was about what well, does the things change with respect to multiple concussions? And, you know, potentially, and, and that has to do more with when was the recency of that last concussion is probably the biggest driver. But I think there are, are more salient predictors or factors from a clinical perspective that you're kind of weighing on uh, to how you may treat things. And the main thing mainly is, how crappy does someone feel? Because you're not going to accelerate someone through all these stages if they don't feel well, you're going to take your time and you want to make that. So the other thing to keep in mind is that anytime you manage a condition, it's not just the concussion or it's not just the ankle sprain. It's what else happened at the same time? What comorbid issues potentially happen? And so with concussion, you have musculoskeletal injuries, neck injuries. You could, they could actually sprain their ankle and also hit their head. 
So <laughs> you need to think of core morbid issues. The biggest thing that you need to also consider is what does that patient bring in to that experience? Do they have, have a history of multiple concussions? Do they have certain personalities? Do they have potentially anxiety, depression? And so in totality, those are the things that are potentially going to you know, dictate how fast or how slow you move through that recovery process. Well, I really appreciate you um, enlightening us all with that. And even the way you reframed it, and I was taking mental notes too, because I think you're right. The idea of stages to stressors is very key. Uh, distinction. Um, and it just even hearing everything you were saying, it, it takes me back to like how far we've come because I was, you know, told to being periodically woken up uh, while I was sleeping and staying in a dark room, which we've gone miles ahead from. And even just hearing the way that you broke each uh, stress down, I think was really enlightening for all of us as we um, are trying to understand just how challenging this recovery process is. And I want to uh, direct this next question to you, Katie, because as we keep going through these elements, making sure I don't use the word stages, because I'm it's a very poignant thing that you said, um, there's obviously challenges that an athlete might encounter with timelines. They obviously have, we heard Bella talked about it, we heard in the last panel, they want to get back in as soon as possible. So how, from an athletic care provider perspective, can you ensure that they get back to the returning to play with confidence? Yeah, and that's a really good question. I think I'm just going to echo kind of what's been said already today by multiple people. So, um, and Michael, you've made my job a little bit easier by <laughs> outlining a lot of those uh, phases because I think I see it more as that continuum as well rather than kind of uh, dead stop phases or stages. Um, and that's, I think, where athletes get caught is when they are no longer allowed to like progress. Um, they are told, okay, you didn't pass this X test at this phase. Now you are stuck in this phase. Um, whereas there are a lot of other things that potentially could be used to progress that person forward. Um, and I think it really comes down to um, looking at not only just like those kind of sensory, cognitive, and physical components, but the psychosocial components of what's going on in that person's life and that Bella alluded on is that the sense of self is then, you know, if you're, everything that you were doing maybe for like 60, 70% of sometimes 80% of your week um, has now been removed and you're no longer able to continue those activities, um, then that also takes a big hit on that individual's sense of self. Um, and so we see like de uh, deep personification, that kind of thing come up too as well as they lose the value um, maybe they can't even go to school and perhaps that also is a big component of, you know, maybe they're in their final year of high school and they are in sport and they are, you know, in academics and they, you know, there is progressions you need to meet in life to just move into university or things like that, um, that I often encounter. And I think, um, the, the athletes or patients that I typically encounter are the ones that are sort of like ex have maybe exhausted their immediate resources and come see me when they've hit these roadblocks. Um, and so for those people, we kind of go back to the basis of looking at all of those components individually um, and try to break them down again, because maybe they've just maybe overshot something um, and maybe it's vision or maybe it's another piece that just maybe wasn't addressed properly from the start. And that's where a multidisciplinary team comes into play, um, whether it is from an optometry standpoint that I do work quite closely with and I know my barriers of where I refer on those. Um, as well as from a mental health perspective, um, maybe it is speaking with coaches and other um, components of strength and conditioning, depending on the level of sport you're in. Um, and so I think what happens is, from what I've encountered anyways, once we break down those processes again, we start to rebuild them and sort of layer them back in, like he's referring to your cake analogy there as well. Um, and so I think as a therapist is the understanding of when to layer and maybe when to scale down. Um, but looking at that kind of, I think it was like a mountain uh, image in that um, last talk by Jeremy there, um, of kind of staging it as like there's plateaus in some parts where you might be in that stage for a while, but there's maybe a lot of different things we can do there. Um, so maybe if they can't do the Buffalo concussion treadmill test, maybe we find another mode of exercise that they can do in that time or a different activity that they can start doing to kind of facilitate some of those things. Uh, rather than being like, okay, if you can't do this, then you're just going to be back to nothing. Um, there has to be things that we can figure out that that person can do. Um, so we don't just remove their, their everything kind of valuable to them at that time. There's got to be something we can reintegrate and sort of 
um, add that sense of self back in um, because then we reduce the incidence of those mental health concerns kind of impeding injury. And so some of the things that maybe predict that difficulty in recovery could be the initial onset um, burden of symptoms or severity of symptoms, but also things like previous mental health concerns or maybe learning concerns or maybe it's visual concerns that those things start to interact or maybe they reemerge a little bit more prominently post concussion and maybe they were already there. Um, so it's really identifying like maybe the person in front of you and what's going on kind of in their life cycle socially as well as competitively and maybe academically. Um, and understanding like what you can strategically do at each phase um, and then how you kind of layer it in. So as I educate clinicians, um, from understanding kind of the basics and fundamentals of those cognitive pieces, of the sensory pieces and the motor pieces and how all those things work together because our brain doesn't operate in silos. I think one of the things I've always said is we have to kind of break down those silos at some points in rehab um, and start to integrate. And so strategically learning how to integrate and monitor and also have open communication with the person so that if they start to run into difficulties, like maybe, okay, we've actually returned to some sports specific activity, but we didn't maybe encounter the fact like in the clinic, I can't replicate a 60 minute practice, for example. So, you know, maybe we did a bunch of tests, they did exertion, they did all this stuff, but then, you know, at the end of practice, their coach decided to do sprints um, and there's quick turns, there's high intensity, and then they start to get dizziness and things and they start to catastrophize like, oh my gosh, I'm going backwards. Um, but really it's just something like a new exposure, a new stress that we haven't uncovered yet. And we just have to be confident and again, it's like educate and keep kind of in line with them and make sure that they understand that it's just another kind of stressor we're exposing to and we just have to rebuild resiliency and capacity for those things. I think I answered that question a little bit. No, I think you crushed that question. Yeah. I think that was great. And I think it was incredible just how you kind of phrased it on the resilience side, also on this holistic approach of integrating things. I think that's so key to meeting the athletes where they are. Um, as they are creatures of competition and creatures of habit. So having someone with that mindset, I think is just so beneficial. Um, and at this point in time, we're going to open it up for Q and A's. Keep in mind, there's going to be a lot of time after where you can ask some questions. Uh, we only, I think, have time for a few questions. But uh, yeah, this would be, if you, Ryan will pass. Hello. Uh, sorry, I'm breaking the professional code here, uh, but uh, I'm supposed to be invisible, but I think the urgency of the matter uh, made me voice my concern. Uh, I had a very rich history of uh, concussions, grew up in a tough environment, about 15 or so. And I wanted to know, now I'm at a stage where some of the s severe uh, issues are impacting my life, and I wanted to know what would you recommend uh, to do like a step-by-step -step process, uh, briefly to describe how it started. Like uh, it started with like moderate to mild, I guess, levels. Uh, at some point, I actually lost my vision during one of the after the traffic accident for like forty minutes. Uh, fell from the waterfall. Also had like head fracture. Uh, at this point, I two years ago I injured my neck. And that's when the like really bad things started to happen. I became paralyzed for a few hours, and then I went to emergency, and they said uh, I damaged the vertebral artery. I had like dissection or something like that. So now sometimes I have these weird dreams when I die, and any physical activity is out of the window. And I wanted to know, in this case, how do you approach this problem? Because like I, I try not to think about it, but it's very present. And uh, there, there is this repetitive weird element that I'm experiencing death, like from like suffocation or like different scenarios. But I feel like I don't know. It's a weird sensation. Like you have this electric wave going on, and yeah. Anybody, what would you recommend to do with this whole thing? I was just trying to give like a picture of symptoms. So yeah, sorry. Thanks.
Oh, um, I think that's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good question and it's, a, it's obviously a, a concern, but um, I think that takes a group of practitioners to actually dive into. It sounds from the um, very surface that it's um, probably multifactorial. Dr. Quaid's obviously would be a big piece in that. Um, I'm going to guess, uh, guess that there's probably a cervicogenic, the C1, C2 piece, um, and that would just go on from... Um, you know, uh, definitely deeper than what one clinician could, I think, on this panel answer. I think the only thing I would add to this is uh, I just commend you on obviously your ability to multitask cognitively and physically and also handle that. So, you, you know, at, at some level, uh, your question is actually not concussion specific, I'll be honest. And, and I think it's a, it speaks to probably a more uh, severe injuries and other issues. But nonetheless, the response is correct. And I think you need to take it. The management approach is very similar. What, what, what we're kind of suggesting with concussion is it's interdisciplinary. And so really what you probably need to do personally is identify your main complaints, like what those are, and then kind of match those professionals to to that. Obviously, you're dealing with potentially a head injury. I'd probably want to start with a neurologist uh, and, and then go from there. But realistically, at this point, this far out from your, your potential injury, people would start managing your symptoms. That's how most kind of practitioners would go about this. And so it's, it's just really kind of identifying those salient complaints and then moving to that respective professional. We're just going to have other questions, and then you can talk to them after if that's all right. Yeah. Thank you, though. Hello? I have a question. Um, I'm Seth's dad, for everybody who doesn't know that. Um, but I, I do. that's not my question. My question is, uh, we're talking a lot about uh, clinicians. We're talking a lot about uh, coaches. I want to understand and what's involved with the parent. Because the parent is a big factor in all this. And, you know, having been a parent of, of a son who had a concussion, who at the time many years ago wasn't going to tell me because he wanted to get back into the field of play. Um, and I didn't really know much about it. I've obviously learned a lot <laughs> since he's taken on this. So so the parent and, and getting the parent involved and, and, you know, if you can address that and, and you know, because they are a huge factor. And, and uh, you were talking, I think, about uh, getting all the, you know, all the people involved. And um, yeah, the parents um, and the billet families, um, in some cases, like with my OHL team, um, have a very, very important stake in, in the outcome of, of a concussion. And um, they're the ones that are going to spend actually the majority of the time with the athlete, especially in the critical times where there, there's nighttime and, and all those kinds of things. So we bring the parents in, in all of our education pieces, and we outline roles and responsibility for all stakeholders. And we make sure that they understand, um, like, you know, the panel was saying, we don't, we don't do the wake up every hour and ask them a cognitive question anymore. Um, and we don't typically put them in a dark room. But with that said, there's still a lot of old um, fashioned beliefs and values around how to deal with a concussion and some of that's the toughest things with parents um, and then you add the education so if we do have a parent that happens to be a physician or any of the rest of it they may or may not listen uh, to what we kind of explain and lay out as an education piece but it is one of our main stakeholders um, in any teams that I work with where we do explain very explicitly what their roles are um, and allow them access to us so my parents all have um, access to my email and if there's any, you know, questions as they go, we make sure that we respect those questions and, and answer them immediately. Um, and because, you know, concussions, as we know, it are, are kind of like snowflakes and there are so many different factors and everyone has such different symptoms. Um, and we basically give them access to our network. So, you know, we make them understand that we do speak and, and deal with psychotherapists and maybe it's a strength and conditioning person, maybe it's a visual expert. Um, and they go to them with them to those appointments. So we make sure that they're felt, you know, supported and that they're part of our team and part of our network as well. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, I will, I will add one piece here and I will say that parents are sometimes the most difficult part of the management process. So, and, and I'll be honest with that, they can be facilitators, but they can be barriers 
uh, to the management of concussion. And it, it's a very difficult solve, I'll be honest, because for the younger athlete, they're obviously in control and they're their guardian and they're often with them. Uh, on the flip side, I deal with professional hockey players in the, in, in the NHL and, so, and we implemented a quiet room. It's like, how did the NHL implement a quiet room to pull people off the play to get for an evaluation? It was actually an easier solve because we, we use the players as the avenue for educating. It's like, listen, we're not trying to you know, derail your career, but we use other players to advocate, listen, if everything's fine, you'll be back in play. And so it was a real advocacy role. And even, even within the PA, we have former players call the players if they complain, saying, listen, the reason we're doing this is this because A, B, and C. And, and so that was actually a really important solve for us to, to pull people uh, in, in a professional setting. Um, it's actually much more challenging in grassroots sports uh, in, with the parents, I'll be honest. So I will recognize that that they're, they're, they could be facilitators, but there also could be barriers uh, with, with them as well. And, it's, and so it's quite difficult, I'll be honest. Do you mind if I... Um, in the sport environment I work in, there are both minors and parents. Um, so just to spin this on an angle of, if we're thinking of not just the youth athlete, but um, even the adult athlete, and sometimes they are the parent. Um, and so, you know, there is that communication of, typically with a parent, I try to get as much of that insider information of like the personal changes or things they notice about their child if they're young enough that maybe they're not able to communicate it as well as an adolescent. Um, whereas some adolescents like don't really want their parents necessarily in the room when we do things. But typically it is a more like encompassed approach. But for the athletes who go home and have to then take care of a dependent as well, um, in that scenario, it's, it's really difficult because they're now leaning on their partner if their partner is even available for them. Um, and so there is another like, I just wanted to mention that factor as well as if we spin that problem and look at it as the parent who has the concussion and is trying to return to sport as well.